over the last uh, 40 years, uh, we saw a um, steep uh, increase of inequality and to really understand the technological development uh, in relationship to what happened uh, during that period, we should uh, really start in the post-war uh, World War II period, uh, looking at uh, the ways in which uh, for about 30 years you had uh, relative uh, uh, equality and you know if we were white, uh, certainly uh, living in the United States, uh, that was the case. Uh, but then in 1972, uh, uh, around that time, things started to change with a real uh, increase of productivity of the American workers while uh, their wages uh, stagnated. So uh, from then on, really a real increase uh, in income uh, inequality, which then culminated in 2008, where you had uh, the financial crisis. Uh, and around that time as well, we had the emergence of the sharing economy. So a real change in the digital economy where companies like Amazon Mechanical Turk, the crowdsourcing company, and also Uber and Deliveroo and TaskRabbit later, later on, uh, preyed on people's ability to uh, basically take, accept very low paying jobs. Also at this whole time, right, so you had a shift away from direct employment towards contract work. So if you uh, get up uh, in the morning and you uh, check your uh, phone and uh, go to uh, you know platforms uh, that uh, offer news or entertainment. Uh, chances are that all of you uh, sitting here uh, would just go to some five uh, sites that are owned by a number of people that is so small that you could probably fit them into uh, one Google bus. Uh, and the uh, question is not only that of ownership, but is also one of um, of basically co-determining what is happening on those sites, right? So we depend so much on these platforms, but have absolutely no say in what happens on them. And uh, you know that's a, a clear problem. So you see basically how there was this really close relationship between, I mean, you know, uh, in the 1840s when uh, unions and cooperatives both emerged uh, at the same time, also in the same geographic region in the uh, you know United Kingdom. Uh, uh, there was this very close relationship uh, for some time, right, to push back against precarity, right? And you had, um, um, in the 1880s, of course, the uh, Knights of Labor that actually, as uh, a union, instituted a lot of cooperatives, right? Right, so there's another part to this, right, which is of course uh, regulation. So, and this is, uh, I think there we really have to be clear that there's a real difference between uh, North America or the United States in particular and Europe, right? So where what we find here is a real turn to municipalism. So people turn to their local policymakers, they turn to, turn to their local communities where uh, of course, in, in you know France, Germany, or uh, Spain, you know, Catalonia, uh, you have a much stronger orientation towards the government to to look for support uh, for you know the worker, the citizen. However, we also need to acknowledge that like, capital drives a lot of uh, technological development. And so there, it's also not an even playing, playing field, right? So it's not that these actors are all equally strong. So, you know, some with these companies that have this, and these enormous resources, of course, can shape automation, for example, in a different way than other actors could. So, and this is also very much resonating with, uh, you know, uh, Keynesian ideas of uh, technological progress where he suggested that just slowing down the progress, right, like slowing down these developments makes the negative impact, the negative externalities on workers so much smaller, right. So, uh, and uh, so by them, let's say, owning the trucks, right, or owning the taxis, uh, they can still decide, let's say, to shift to self-driving cars, but then they, as a cooperative, would be the owners of AI instead of, you know, unemployed, unemployed drivers. Mm -hmm. 
So a shift towards uh, contract work, a shift um, away from employment. And what that meant, right, so there is no uh, romance about employment uh, at all, right? So that it's not that that was an ideal uh, relationship, uh, but uh, basically all the rights that people worked uh, for, for over uh, 200 years, right? Just think of the Haymarket riots, or think of uh, the you know, eight-hour workday uh, and you know, the labor history, all the things that people achieved, uh, health insurance, uh, you know, paid vacation, all of these things kind of disappeared, if you like, uh, through that sort of introduction of these technological models in combination with these other processes of the shift to contract work, right? So the gig economy, essentially. And uh, so there you have, uh, you know, people, uh, companies operate illegally uh, at uh, an hourly rate of two to three dollars uh, an hour with Amazon Mechanical Turk, for example. Uh, you have uh, Uber drivers today uh, making barely minimum wage, um, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so that's like just like one look. Give me a second. And. Uh, in this uh, economy, basically, service work has become uh, the lowest paid uh, uh, sector. So what you really find in, uh, American, uh, in, in the American context today is uh, a real uh, broken social contract, right? So this uh, agreement, this uh, proverbial agreement that Rousseau talked about, uh, is, is really not uh, upheld uh, today. So there is what you find is a real shift in how people identify, right? So out of this experience of uh, inequality uh, comes also uh, an increased uh, experience and identity uh, of and identification with nationalism, right? Uh, and uh, so all the examples that we see with the rise of uh, Trumpism, but also all across Europe and in uh, many con uh, other countries, uh, I think is an expression of that as well. So after the crisis in 2008, not only did you have the emergence of these companies that basically preyed on the uh, willingness of people to work uh, for uh, very little money, but you also had uh, a renaissance of uh, cooperatives, uh, people interested in the commons, the solidarity economy, etc., uh, community community currencies, and uh, uh, you know now more recently blockchain technology. People thinking about ways in which they can push back. Uh, this is also an argument that uh, this time period after two thousand eight also really convinced people of the strength of this uh, cooperative model because you saw that uh, there was these uh, businesses were way less likely to uh, go bankrupt than uh, others, right? So you saw a bigger resilience of those, uh, of those companies and of those business forms. So I think there is, uh, I talked a lot about labor but there's a whole other strand uh, to this discussion, and uh, that is about infrastructure. Right? So what you have in the digital economy is, uh, is, is essentially a winner-takes-all uh, economy based on the network effects that you see playing out with the likes of Facebook uh, and Uber, right? So network effects uh, being uh, the power of a technology that comes with a number of its users, right? So if you have two fax machine, this is a very uninteresting and non-consequential technology, but if you have billions of people using fax machines, then suddenly that becomes incredibly important. And that's exactly what you have in the digital economy, where uh, platform, there's an extreme uh, uh, difference between the power of the owners of platforms and the users. Right. So, and this power imbalance uh, is uh, is you know a real problem. A very central discussion is that of infrastructure. Right. So, uh, if we want to push back against these conglomerates like uh, you know Facebook and Apple, etc., the big five, uh, then uh, we really need to develop uh, a decentralized internet, which would mean uh, a cooperative cloud. 
cooperative data commons, right? So how can you create standards that translate across the internet and allow cooperatives to work together and do what cooperatives are meant to do? And so this is where, uh, having worked uh, on digital labor for the last uh, decade, really, and having you know, published on this and convened networks uh, here at the New School for the past 10 years around this, this, these questions that come up with digital labor, uh, I developed about four years ago a concept that I called uh, platform cooperativism. And uh, that is bringing the almost 200-year-old model of the cooperative uh, business model and the cooperative cultural and political model to the digital economy. So to uh, you know, explain this uh, in, uh, quite simply, you would think, uh, think about uh, what would it be like if an Uber would be owned by its workers? What would it be like if an Airbnb would be owned by a network of cities? Uh, what would it be like if Deliveroo would be taken over by uh, the couriers? Right. So uh, that is the uh, basic uh, was the basic suggestion that I made uh, four years ago, and uh, now you have some uh, 240 businesses around the world following uh, this model. There are research centers uh, in Australia, some starting in Tokyo, Berlin, and Barcelona, and other cities. Uh, focusing on creating an open social economy that is more worker-centered and uh, brings uh, this idea of uh, workplace democracy uh, to the digital economy. Right? So I think that uh, cooperatives in that sense uh, are uh, an, uh, you know, hidden in plain sight. In the United States you have uh, one in three Americans being a member of a cooperative. Uh, they are uh, one billion um, um, co-op members worldwide. Uh, uh, that's also true for Germany and France and of course uh, Spain and Italy. And uh, so what would it be like to bring these uh, one billion co-op members to the digital economy and transform what as of now is a quite extractive uh, form of ownership into something that uh, brings this idea of an open social economy to the internet. Right? So at the heart of this uh, theory and practice of platform cooperativism uh, are four concepts. Right? So one is broad-based platform ownership. So this means that uh, there are uh, that it is uh, that these platforms are owned by the workers and or by the users as well, right? So you could also think of the, taking the model of the consumer cooperative to the internet, what would that uh, look like? And there are examples of that uh, to which we could point and which we could discuss um, already. The second uh, one is democratic governance, right? So just sprinkling around ownership will not change society either, right? Or will not change the internet either, will not democratize uh, the internet either. It's not only about ownership, because ownership has to be uh, paired with democratic governance, right? So people have to have a say what is about what is happening on those platforms. And then thirdly, uh, it's about design, co-design. Right? inclusive design. So what you have in Silicon Valley right now is a, a very waterfall design uh, approach, the big ego designers uh, implementing their ideas and then pushing them out uh, onto uh, people instead of what we are proposing, which is a, a co-design approach that designs with the workers uh, from day one, and not just the workers, but everybody involved, all the stakeholders, a very different approach, which also leads to very different results, including edge populations, people with disabilities, including uh, you know, transgender identities and uh, you know, other uh, identities that are usually not designed for. And lastly, of course, is about uh, open source. Right? So that you can uh, collectively alter the uh, code and uh, don't waste resources in the process. So I think that there are real uh, opportunities uh, through the cooperative model 
in this digital economy right now uh, where we find a real fragmentation of the workforce, right? So workers are uh, freelancers more and more and, uh, you know, are not, uh, you know, are way harder to uh, organize by through unions, etc. So there's a real problem in how to create worker voice uh, in response uh, to these shifts of labor markets to the internet, right? And here I think cooperatives can really make a real decisive um, uh, intervention by offering this cooperative form, which you see with examples like SMART uh, in uh, the SMART uh, Mutual Risk Cooperative in Belgium, which is now in also operating in eight other countries and offering distinct benefits uh, to freelancers in particular, and frankly, offering benefits as a cooperatives that unions used to offer, right? Tangible benefits for creative, uh, creatives in the, in the digital economy that really you know, work to their benefit. Well, uh, there is uh, fair pay, worker voice, right? So workers actually being able to participate and uh, co-govern platforms, uh, democracy in the workplace, and which, if you talk to some of these workers, and I think this is important, you know, when we talk about theories, but they're also actual workers and how they actually relate to those models. And uh, for them, it's then also about uh, personal development. Right? So it's about identity. So suddenly they are not uh, solely mothers or housewives or, uh, you know, uh, workers in, uh, a laundry or in other stores, but they are owners of their own business and they are participating in the digital economy, which many of them could have never dreamt of ever being part of. So that's very empowering to them, right? Um, so positive, other positive um, externalities, positive uh, sides of this are um, a uh, skills training that is introduced into a model where that is absent, right? There is a distribution of value of revenue in the community where otherwise uh, that revenue is extracted and uh, ported to Silicon Valley, right? Um, and uh, there is uh, citizen participation and the idea is that if you have workplace democracy, so if somebody in the workplace feels they have a say and they can co-shape and create, uh, co-create their, their workplace, then they will also act differently as citizens, right? Uh, there's a parallel to what Jokai Benkler uh, talked about in the Wealth of Networks, uh, where he's uh, talked about, you know, in 2004, uh, how there was this um, real, uh, you know, blocks were just emerging and people had all these theories about how blocks will change the way people look at the world. And uh, uh, Jokai Benkler was saying that by virtue of somebody walking down the street and now feeling that they can document a pothole or uh, anything they see and contribute this to the uh, online world, uh, they will also act more participatory as citizens, right? So that this, uh, this posture of you know, uh, workplace democracy, this is what I do with that concept essentially, right? Is also uh, changing them how, uh, in the way they operate in society.